Hello, everyone, and welcome to Greece Public Library's Book Break for November 4th. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pints and Prose Book Discussion Group, as well as the Virtual Science Fiction and Fantasy Book Discussion Group. And as always, I am here with my colleague, Claire. Hello, I'm Claire, and I also um, do book groups. I do As the Page Turns and the Historical Fiction Group on Facebook. And today we have with us, again, a very special guest, Cassie. I don't do any book groups, but I do read <laughs> a lot. Um, I am the library director here, and I was very happy to get a return invitation from Kirsten Absolutely. and Claire. Yes, so if you didn't watch it, Cassie joined us for our spoiler special on Wonderland, Zoya Stage's second book, um, which you can find on our Facebook and YouTube pages if you want to go back and watch that. Um, but today we're doing something a little bit different, which is we are putting a focus on indie publishers. So indie publishing is um, kind of, is it fair to say hobby horse, Cassie? Or is there a better word for it? Hobby horse. I'm not sure I know what hobby horse means. Okay. Uh, pet cause? Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. And for okay. me, it, it started with the Macmillan ebook embargo public libraries. So yes, that was when I really started getting um, almost too focused on, on small <laughs> presses and, and independent publishing, but it, it's turned out pretty well for me. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk a little bit about indie publishing, and then we're going to share some titles from indie publishers with you. So let's dive right in. So Cassie, for those watching who were not aware of the Macmillan ebook embargo, can you give us just like a brief rundown of what that was and why we're talking about it? I will. Um, so, uh, well, let me back up just slightly. Mm -hmm. So um, when we talk about indie publishing, small presses, mm -hmm. for me, that means um, any publisher who's not part of the big five. So the big five publishers are uh, Penguin Random House, Hachette, which I always pronounce wrong, <laughs> Macmillan, HarperCollins, and Simon and & Schuster. So um, Macmillan decided about a year ago that the reason that their business was not doing well was because uh, public libraries were undercutting their business when it came to ebooks. So they, yeah, yeah, that's what a lot of us thought when that happened. <laughs> so they, I um, mean, you know, we already pay a lot more uh, for eBooks to lend through mm -hmm. the local public library than uh, an individual person would. So they really kind of um, went on the attack a little bit with public libraries and were not allowing us to offer to our patrons um, their new releases until after a certain amount of time. So um, libraries got very upset about that and did a lot of screaming and yelling. And this was the time frame when I said, you know what, I don't really want to support um, a big publisher like Macmillan anymore. Mm -hmm. Let me see what other kinds of things are out there. They have since dropped the um, embargo of eBooks, but I still really love the whole idea of, of small presses. Mm -hmm. So what is it, um about a small press that you find appealing? What can we get from a small press that we're not gonna get from one of the big five? Well, if it's okay with you, I will mm -hmm. tell you um, about one of my favorite small presses just mm -hmm. very um, quickly. So it is um, an indie press that is family run. They are headquartered in Columbus, Ohio and they are dedicated to reaffirming the cultural and artistic spirit of the publishing industry. Hmm. So really these are, um, it's kind of for me a little bit like, um, you know, shop local, it, you know, rather than looking at a huge um, publishing conglomerate who, you know, really have to be focused um, in the digital age on publishing those books that are going to have, you know, huge immediate sales. So you think about your James Patterson's, your John Grisham's. So there's not a lot of room for sort of these more um, funky authors who want okay. to get published. And um, just I back like to two, two mm -hmm. dollar radio really quick. I just, I want to share something with you that is on their um, website. Cause I think this really encapsulates it. Our books and films aren't for everyone. <laughs> The last thing the world needs is an indie press releasing books that could just as easily carry a corporate colophon. Our work is for the disillusioned and disaffected. 
the adventurous and independent spirits who thirst for more, who push boundaries and like to witness others test their limits. We know we're not alone. Let's make some noise. And then the last thing about independent press is um, we're very lucky here in Greece um, through the efforts of the two of you to have rolled out Greece Reads and mm -hmm. to have um, good relationships with authors. And for me, an indie press is really um, more focused on the author than, than a big publisher. Cool. It's interesting you say that because the recent um, author visit that we had, which was Kim Michelle Richardson, mm -hmm. the book woman of Troublesome Creep is uh, published by Source Books, which is another indie publisher. Mm -hmm. Ah, cool. But one thing I, I want to jump on where Cassie left off is mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of great book club picks out there in mm -hmm. the indie presses because as Cassie mentioned, you, you have a little bit of leeway with a more original story, not original, but something that's a little different that's going to provoke a discussion, mm -hmm. which I think is what a great book club book or a great book club pick is. It, it's going to have something controversial in there. It's going to have issues in there. Um, so one of the ones that I really like is Algonquin, which is from um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And they do have quite a few authors of color that nice. really appeals to me. Um, also, like a lot of debut novels. Uh, mm -hmm. the Mountain Sing, which is a, a fantastic story mm -hmm. of um, a Vietnamese family of what happened during the war. We did it for historical book club. That mm -hmm. was from there. Uh, yeah. I also did Silver Sparrow by Tayari Jones. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do another one of hers, which is An American Marriage, which Oprah liked that too. <laughs> um, so, and then there's a I printed this out just so you could see the different covers, but one of the ones, you know how I, I just love my Reese Witherspoon. Um, her recent pick, His Only Wife, is also an indie publisher um, and available on Hoopla People in both nice. ebook and audiobook. And I think that's another thing about some of these indie publishers mm -hmm. is, you know, the rights to the books are a little bit more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so we can offer these to the public for like, you know, how we do for our book groups on Facebook, which is everybody can have access to the book, mm -hmm. um, which is awesome. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I found um, when we decided that this was our topic, I kind of went back through my Goodreads uh, history to say like, okay, what have I read? What was an indie press? So the first thing that I was surprised by is that there were... Um, maybe not a bunch, but at least a handful of indie publisher books kind of sprinkled through there. Um, because I confess that publisher is not something that I typically pay attention to, and maybe I should, and maybe now I will pay a little more attention. But like, I just zoom right past that most of the time. Um, so there's that, but then also it can be difficult, I think, because those big five publishers, they each have so many um, imprints. So you might find like most of the science fiction and fantasy books, a lot of them are tour, which is an imprint of one of the big five publishers. So it can be hard to tell without a little bit of research, um, whether your book really is from an indie publishing house or whether it's just a smaller imprint of a larger publisher. Um, so I, Cassie, do you have some suggestions for where to find indie press books? Yes, independent bookstores. Um, and I'll tell you <laughs> how I got onto $2 Radio um, was I was at The Strand in New York City, which is a huge independent bookstore. And I was just kind of browsing around and I stumbled across a title, um, The Deeper the Water, The Uglier the Fish, which had been um, reviewed by NPR uh, and some other places. And so I picked it up and I sort of had a memory of it. And I read it and I was like, wow, this is not like something I would typically be interested, you know, that I would typically mm -hmm. stumble across. And then the nice thing about $2 Radio is they have a little radio mm. on the spine of all of their books. So nice. once I got through that first one, and I am an independent bookstore junkie, 
So I go to McNally Jackson in New York City, and then I go to the Strand. I go to Liftbridge Bookshop in Brockport, mm -hmm. um, in Buffalo. I wish they would open soon, Talking Leaves Bookshop. That's the place where I typically will come across an independent publisher. And I liked that particular book so much that I then went to their website to see what they were about. And typically you can tell, you know, if somebody's an imprint of a bigger publisher, if you do just a little bit of librarianship um, <laughs> on their website. And then I started just browsing bookshelves. <laughs> You've been sitting too still. <laughs> I had been sitting there, we know. <laughs> Waving my arms around a little bit more. I was like, did the power just go off? No, the computer's still on. <laughs> um, so then I just start browsing spines and two dollar radio does it right um, as does uh, this is another one of the independent presses Soho they also do that on the spine so that's kind of how nice. I've been doing it I'll, I just okay. browse and I find things um, and I've kind of stopped buying books online because I like that experience mm -hmm. of going into a bookstore and discovering something new very cool um, for those of you who may be still um, not excited about going into bookstores in person, who still want to do the online shopping, I think many of these publishers um, you can purchase through their individual websites. Um, and there's also a great resource, which is um, bookshop.org. Mm -hmm. So that is um, kind of a coalition of many independent bookstores. Um, where they have like a centralized uh, purchasing interface so you can go and buy your books um, and for every purchase money goes back to independent bookstores. So that's another option uh, for online purchasing. And just one more thing, you know, once you do find a book, so this is um, again a $2 radio. Because they're small and they don't, um, you know, publish a huge amount of books in every year, at the back of all of their books is they have just a little um, shot of the cover of some of their other mm -hmm. titles and then just a little um, synopsis with, you know, a one line, um, you know, New York Times notable book of 2016, deeply satisfying New York Times book review, and then just a couple of sentences um, about, about the title. Nice. Um, so I think we also all brought a couple of indie selections. Shall we talk about some books? I say yes. Uh, who wants to start? Claire. Claire will start. Here we go. <laughs> the Storied Life of A.J. Fickery. Uh, I was kind of surprised because like you, Kirstra, I went back through some of the things I read. And once mm -hmm. I found out what the names of the publishers were, this was another Algonquin one. Um, Gabrielle Zevin. She writes a lot of teen books, mm -hmm. but this one was kind of a quirky, fun story about a man that is a bookseller. Um, he's having a horrible year. His wife has died. His, his shop is doing terrible. 2020 in the book? Pardon me? No, and then, um, <laughs> and then somebody leaves a baby on his doorstep, and then he has to figure out what to do with it, and, you know, ends up you know, it's a, it's a feel good book. Mm -hmm. So God knows we could use that right now. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I love this one. She also wrote one about the afterlife that I know was on my daughter's reading list when she went to Mercy called Elsewhere that I believe I own mm -hmm. in the teen collection. But um, this one was one that I was pleasantly surprised and was like, oh, wow. So that is a, you know, an independent press. Um, nice. And I know a lot of people really like this one too. Mm -hmm. I, I put yeah, it, it was kind of my... a breakout, wasn't it? A couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah, I think that was one of her like switching from teen to adult mm, fiction type okay. things. So, got it. So I can do one um, mm -hmm. that I've already held up a couple of times. So um, <laughs> this is a two dollar uh, press. The word for two dollar radio press. The word for woman is wilderness by Abby Andrews. So um, our protagonist, Erin, is 19 years old, and she leaves her parents' home in Middle England uh, and hitches solo by boat and car from England to Iceland to Greenland to Canada, ultimately going all across Canada and winding up in Alaska. She's making a documentary film 
um, about how men are allowed, maybe even encouraged, to express this kind of rugged individualism and freedom more than women are. And while she's searching um, for a female version of the mountain man myth, she ultimately comes to the conclusion, uh, this is my interpretation of the conclusion she comes to, um, is that men from Thoreau to Ted Kaczynski got it all wrong. So it's kind of, it's a feminist version of, um, I don't know if you ever read the uh, John Krakauer nonfiction book that was yes. Into the Wild that was based yes. on Christopher McCandless's Life and mm -hmm. Death. Um, so this is kind of, if you can imagine being a 19 year old girl from the middle of England, traveling by yourself, like hitching rides on boats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and she runs into some kind of um, really sketchy situations. And it makes you think about sort of those um, rugged individualist things when it's a man and how that um, plays out if it's, if it's a woman. So highly nice. recommend that one. Very cool. I'm definitely adding that one to my list. I feel like yeah. I've read the Sounds description good. somewhere of that one before. So yeah, nice. Um, okay, so my first one is from Quirk Books, um, which looking through their website, I've actually read a few of theirs, so I'm going to have to pay more attention to them, certainly. Um, but the book that I'm going to talk about is The Last Policeman by Ben Winters. I read that because uh, you told me to, didn't I? <laughs> yes. I think I did, yes. <laughs> Um, so this is one that I dug up out of my Goodreads queue um, that I really liked. It's the first book I want to say in a trilogy, and I haven't read the others, just the first one. Um, but I'm going to have to go back to it because I remembered as I was looking at it how much I enjoyed it. So the setup for this one is that um, there is an asteroid on a collision course with Earth. So scientists have found the asteroid, they've charted the course, and that's it. We're toast in like two years. So there's this period of time where everyone knows that the world is ending, but it hasn't ended yet. So it's kind of pre-apocalyptic in a way. Um, so our main character is Hank Pallas. He's a policeman. Um, and so since the announcement of this impending asteroid, um, people are like freaking out in all the ways that you would expect them to. So they're walking off the job. Why should I go punch a clock when the world is ending? And there are lots of folks who are committing suicide. Um, so one day someone reports a suicide, he goes to investigate and something just seems a little off um, and everyone and everything is kind of telling him, just let it go. It's the asteroid, like there's nothing to see here, but he starts digging and digging into it. Um, so it's a really interesting book. So it's a like a police procedural, but it's got this added layer of the end of the world sort of hanging over it. And it's, you know, a lot about the question of what would you do if you knew the world was ending? Like, how would you go on? So. I really liked it. Like I said, I'm going to have to go back and read the others, but I very much enjoyed it as well. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. All right. I will um, talk about Tayari Jones' Silver Sparrow. Mm -hmm. um, this one starts out with the first sentence is, my father, James Witherspoon, is a bigamist. So <laughs> you, you go right from there um, where a man in Atlanta, a prominent black man has two wives um, and the two daughters of course end up meeting one another and that's how the story mm. evolves and unfortunately the his first wife the real wife doesn't know about um, the secret family but they know about her and that daughter um, so of course you have you know the longing of uh, the secret daughter as to why she can't be or she wants to know like what the other girl has that she doesn't have because she's she's beautiful she's smart they both do a lot of things so there's like navigating this world of okay when is one of these people going to meet when when is this all going to go down um and to find out the reasons like why her mother got them into this situation so it really was interesting um 
and it was it you know a book discussion pick for for me for as the page turns nice. so a lot of people really got into just that whole family dynamic you know the whole secret relationships you know what sisters do um and of course like what makes a man make this decision and keep these two women like this so really good interesting read nice um did that one come out before or after American Marriage? I think this one came out before okay. American Marriage. Okay. Um, Which so like that, it's, they're sick. both set in yeah. Atlanta, you know, area. So, cool. Yeah. So um, I have another uh, $2 radio, and I love the cover. <laughs> There's just something about uh, that line drawing that really drew me to it. And you know all the tattoos and the little tiny pair of underpants. <laughs> so this is um, how to get into the Twin Palms, and I'm going to see if I can not um, mess her name up too too badly. Carolina Vatslaviak, I think that's about right. So um, Anya is the uh, twenty-something daughter of Polish immigrants. I am half Polish, and it was very interesting to me to sort of. Um, see her parents and Polish culture through her eyes. So she came to the United States, I think when she was about seven or eight years old. So um, she's in her early 20s. She lives by herself um, in a predominantly Russian neighborhood of Los Angeles. So she struggles sort of throughout the novel um, with her cultural identity, often with bizarre and very unsettling results. Um, and it's very interesting to have something that's set in the United States in Los Angeles where um, the cultural struggle, strife, immigrant story, whatever you want to call it, really doesn't have much of anything to do with America. It's really, she's Polish, she lives in a Russian area, and she um, stalks the nearby Twin Palms nightclub, which she considers to be the pinnacle of exclusivity in the Russian community in the area of Los Angeles where she lives. So because she's Polish um, and she doesn't speak Russian, uh, she uh, really needs an entry ticket into the Twin Palms. So she begins um, pursuing a Russian gangster <laughs> whose name is Lev, uh, who frequents the Twin Palms. And it's, um, it's not a happy story by any means, but it was very interesting to me. And, you know, you're asking, um, you know, what do you get sometimes from a small press that you don't get from, you know, a big publisher? This is just such a sort of, you know, pointed and um, tiny slice of, of something. I think that maybe it's not, you know, universally appealing, but for someone mm -hmm. like me, it was like, wow, I've never really you know, had access to what it must be like to be, you know, second generation Polish living in a Russian neighborhood uh, in Los Angeles. So um, again, not a terribly happy tale, but a very interesting and bizarre story. Nice. Nice. Um, I just realized as you were talking that my last one is also not super happy, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so I have The Orphan of Salt Winds by Elizabeth Brooks. This is from Tin House Books, which is uh, in Portland and Brooklyn. Uh, so very indie. <laughs> um, so this one, it's interesting because I would not have initially necessarily thought of this as being a prime candidate for being an indie publisher. It's um, historical fiction. Um, the little blurb on the cover is actually from A.O. and Ivy. Uh, which is what caught my eye, who is the author of The Snow Child, which was one of our Rochester Reads books a few years ago. It was and the kinds first of year, I it. think, that they came to Greece. Okay. Right there, yeah. The, yeah, I remember that. Okay. Um, ah, I'm sad I missed that. But anyway, um, and her blurb likens the book to Jane Eyre, which is one of my favorite classics. Um, so we've got 10-year-old uh, Virginia, um, in 1939, she is an orphan and she goes to live with Clem and Lorna, um, her adoptive parents, um, at Salt Winds, which is um, sort of a big house on the edge of a salt marsh um, in England. And so it's 1939, war is looming. Um, if not already there, forgive my shaky grasp of 
European history. Um, and so we have this 1939 story and there's also Virginia looking back from 2015. Um, so towards the end of a very long life. Um, and Virginia is sort of trying to navigate the relationship between her adoptive parents, which seems strained, their family secrets, um, you know, things we don't talk about. <laughs> um, I was trying to move, but I couldn't figure out something to do. Yeah. Um, and then a German plane crash lands in the marsh near their house. Um, and Clem, who is Virginia's adoptive father, goes out into the marsh to investigate. Um, and I'm not going to give anything away because, you know, a lot of the fun of these atmospheric family secrets books is kind of piecing together the little clues about what happened. Um, but it is also a sad book. There's, there's tragedy. And I think the ending um, fits, but it doesn't tie things up in a nice happy bow. Um, so it's a fitting ending, but it's still kind of a sad ending, which I think maybe is one of the things um, that you get, you know, it's not going to be an ending that makes everyone happy um, as far as readers go. Uh, so, um, but like I said, it, it definitely fit and, you know, concluded the story in a way that I found very satisfying, even if it wasn't happy. So. Yeah, so that's mine. So kind of traditional setup, but maybe non-traditional ending to that one. But a nice atmospheric read, especially now that it's getting kind of cold and gray. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if Claire had another book, but you were just talking about atmospheric. So I have mm -hmm. a final one. Sure. If Claire wants to, do you have a third? Well, you know what I realized is I grabbed the wrong book by this author. I grabbed Descent, and I actually read one. I think it was called The Current. But um, this is kind of a good thriller. I I'll talk to The Current, even though I'm holding up the wrong book. Um, <laughs> both by Tim Johnson. My right. lights have uh, gone off twice. You know, they've, they've turned off twice. Yeah, I really think yeah. there's very little you could do at this point that would rival that. So. But um, two girls going home, I believe, from college uh, in a car, goes into a creek. One lives, one dies. Mm -hmm. They think the car was bumped. Who did it? Um, it's, it's just an interesting mystery with like, and this one also looks like it was set up in either the mountains, Colorado. Um, I, this one has actually been on my list, so... Uh, a young family, the daughter goes running and disappears. And then what, mm -hmm. it's more like what happens to the family after mm -hmm. this horrible tragedy happens. I think her brother was running with her. So um, Who's I the like it. This is another Algonquin one. I just okay. went wild rogue with, uh, <laughs> you know, when I got into their website and realized how many books I've either read. Uh, there was another one I had read that was, Something of, it has a lemon on the front, and I can't think of the name of it. It was either How to Be Happy or, but it was written by an obituary writer from Alaska. <laughs> so there you have it. You know, it's like you were saying, quirky, kind of strange. It's uh, interesting what you just said that, you know, you went into Algonquin's website and you realized how many of those, like, you're approaching it from the opposite. Like, I find a publisher, and then I find that I like all of their books. Or you know, I, mm -hmm. I ha have part of me enjoys their books, and you you just kind of pick books, and it turns out they're all kind of from the same independent publisher. Yeah, kind of interesting. Yeah. So um, the last one that I wanted to talk about, and it's not two dollar radio, big surprise. It's uh, Soho Press, which was founded in uh, 1986. They're headquartered in Manhattan. And they publish um, between 80 and 90 books a year. So that's, you know, that's very different than, than any of the big publishing houses. So they have um, three imprints of Soho Press. They have Soho Press, Soho Crime, and Soho Teen. And um, Kirster, when you were talking about your last book, you were talking about atmospheric. So mm -hmm. Soho Crime publishes 
very atmospheric crime fiction mm -hmm. that's set all over the world. So if you want to read, you know, a police procedural that's set in Paris or in South Africa, um, they publish a lot of that. And I am currently um, absolutely obsessed with and in the middle of um, a series of books that uh, Soho Crime publishes by an author named Mick Heron, and it's the Slough House series. So it is set in London, um, and Slough House is where the washed up MI5 spies go to while away what's left okay. of their failed careers. So they're called slow horses, and they've all disgraced themselves in some way to get sent to Slough House for the rest of their careers. One example uh, from the first book in the series, like, you know, just leaving a folder prominently stamped top secret behind on the London Underground. Um, and then, you know, remembering that you left it there the next day when you see it on the morning news. So that's <laughs> one of the characters who um, is at Slough House. And if you're an Office fan, you know, The Office, the American sitcom was originally, so the American sitcom is, um, set in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which at one point was called the armpit of the nation. Slough is um, to uh, England what Scranton is in America. So the joke about why they call it Slough House, it's not located in Slough, but it's so bad it might as well be. <laughs> so I'm a very big fan of um, smart and really sharp British wit. Mm -hmm. And Mick Heron absolutely has this in spades. It's, it's very interesting for me to read him because I'm so invested in what's going to happen in the plot next that sometimes I find myself jumping ahead and I'm missing some of that wit, that just mm -hmm. really pointed, um, interesting, um, sarcastic, ironic uh, stuff. So highly recommend um, the Slough House series by Mick Heron. I'm definitely going to have to look up the website for the Soho crime because that's oh, yeah. like it, it checks all of my boxes. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. Thanks. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, Cassie, for joining us again. This has been Welcome. delightful. Um, and I hope everyone goes out and visits their local indie bookstore and maybe picks up some indie press books. And please, as always, talk to us about them and let us know what you think. Um, so thank you everyone. We will be back in a couple of weeks and we'll see you then. Bye. Bye. <laughs>